just wanted to kind of give you guys a bit of a just general walkthrough. Um, this is going to be kind of informal, just because, you know, I really just want to give you guys kind of a high level of um, how I used the assets and what I did with them, and um, kind of the, just the general, uh, my general views on them as well. So starting off, um, most of the assets, or actually all of the assets, are uh, imported directly off of the Megascan site. And if I just hop on into my login here, and we'll just jump over to the library. Um, we can come right on over into packs. And this is actually part of what I pulled from. Actually, the majority of this is all what I pulled from. So you have, uh, you can see kind of here clearly, um, all of the assets, all from relatively, it looks like they're from the same biome. There's also more assets and stuff available. They're updating this as they go, which is really nice. But I really wanted to talk about um, you know, kind of the process of downloading these things and really why I feel that the mega scans are so useful. Um, when we're pulling the assets and we're kind of downloading them all, um, they are, you, we have access to obviously the albedo, the cavity, the displacement, the normal, the roughness. But here we have access to the high poly, the Z tool, the LODs, and the brushes that are made. Okay, what this allows us to do is this can you literally have something that's one-to-one -one with the scan data, but then you can take that and make your own things with it, which is so, so vital. Um, the, the mega scans, I think a lot of times people think, well, this is just scan data. I'm locked into this. You're not. You have total control over the asset from, you know, from just a general texturing and modeling standpoint as well because you have the source data, which is so, so useful because this is kind of one of the huge reasons why I think Quixel stuff is so so useful. Um, not only do you get the high poly, um, but you also get all of the Z tools and the brushes. Okay, now the scan data itself is really high quality, but I'm sure just like any of you guys who use CG Textures or any other texture website, you guys also know that you have to vary the content, otherwise all your stuff looks kind of starts looking like everyone else's. You can do that really easily with this stuff now, especially because they give exposure to all of the assets. It's something that I think is monumentally huge to these guys. Obviously, the scan data is of a ridiculously high quality. You want to be able to alter and control them. So you have the ability to do all of that with, with the source content that they give. Um, and I've even modified some things. And we'll show, I'll show you some of the modifications that were made in the shaders a little later. Um, but there's a lot of flexibility in the content. And that allows you to really iterate with stuff. And it allows you to honestly spend your time in kind of some really... Uh, you know, in a, I think a bit more creative of a space. Don't get me wrong, I love sculpting rocks. I've been sculpting them for years. But um, if I can spend six, maybe seven hours to build a full scene, that's that's pretty good. Um, and, you know, from, you know, we have to, you know, for me at least, I always try to tell people you got to balance the, um, the artistic side with also the production side and really making sure that you are leveraging those in a really good and creative way. The scan data is ridiculously awesome to use um, and I think it allows you to start getting into the creative flow a little quicker. Um, so let's jump back into Unreal. We're going to talk just kind of briefly about the general process for laying out the map and kind of the ease of use of everything and really just talk some, about some of the shaders and talk a little bit about some of the optimization stuff that you can utilize with the scan data. And uh, I'm sure I'll talk a lot about uh, my views on scan data because I, I, I do think it's just like anything in our field. When it's new, uh, people are very apprehensive about it. But it's definitely the future, and it's here to stay. So, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about that as well. And let's talk a little bit more about what um, kind of what I did in the process that I took um, with laying out the scene and kind of just going through and roughly creating it. When I do a lot of these kind of environments, um, I'm definitely not the <laughs> number one expert in this, but I have a lot of fun with them, and I really like to use uh, the foliage tool, um, especially for using a ton of these assets. I mean, you can actually see how many foliage assets in the scene they're pulling from. Um, nothing super crazy in terms of settings on the foliage actors. Um, literally use most of their default settings. I, I adjusted the density a little bit. Um, they were really, really straightforward to use. So in terms of just general asset fidelity, um, 
the stuff is fantastic. I mean, you know, it's really high res, really well detailed. Um, I didn't do anything super crazy with the shaders. I do want to show you guys uh, my shader workflow. Let me just pull up my details panel here. And I just wanted to call out the assets a little bit here. Um, so try to stay fairly clean, even though I, you know, it's me, so I probably didn't do the best job. Um, but let's go ahead and look at one of these assets here. Let's go ahead and grab this guy. And I want to talk a little bit about um, some uh, some things under the hood and some things about the shading. So let's first start with the shading because that's always the fun part. Um, we can see here I didn't go in and compress and do any RMA uh, mapping with this or MRA depending on what you're doing. Um, I really just took the assets as is. Um, the goal of this was just to really create the content, kind of get used to it. Um, so I ba basically made a base PBR shader. Um, and let's go ahead and look at this. I actually made two versions of this. And I'll show you the kind of the basic rundown. Really, let's make this big so you guys can see it. Really, really simple things here, right? I have an albedo. Um, I have uh, a multiply to give me control over the brightness. Um, I have this use cavity uh, as overlay switch, and that's just looking up to a blend node with um, the cavity map and again a cavity adjustment parameter. Um, that all gets multiplied against the vertex color. I'll show you why that happens a little later. Um, I have a metallic input. I also have my roughness uh, controls. Uh, same things with displacement. I also have some trace. Uh, things that I'm doing with its displacement when I want to use them, so it basically will tessellate further, or closer or further away, depending on uh, camera viewing distance. Um, in terms of just general performance, tessellation is expensive, so you know, just bear, bear in mind that if you're trying to do this, you have to be really wise with it. Um, and of course, detail texturing, and those all get fed into material instances. And I cannot stress this enough with you guys. Material instances are fantastic. Uh, they're, they really do help a lot. Um, really quick, since we're actually talking about materials, I do want to just touch base on this. This is super standard, and I know people know this, but I'm just going to bring it up anyway, <laughs> because I do think it's important. And I always forget to do this. For some reason, whenever I build I build a million plants in Unreal, and every time I do it, I always forget to do it. Um, it you know, this is pretty basic plant setup. Um, also, just in terms of you guys who are looking at this, like asking about optimization and stuff, I did not do any channel mapping or embedded mapping. Basically, I'm not combining the uh, RGBA channels to make a single draw call. You would definitely want to do that if you were doing this for, well, for anything, basically, for game, mobile, whatever, just to save. Um, but for the demo, I didn't do that. It's just easier for me to kind of just show everything. Um, but you know, in terms of optimization, you definitely would want to combine these. You know, you'd want your alpha channel to probably be embedded in your albedo and whatnot. Um, but anyway, uh, basic setup here. Um, I like to have control over the albedo in case I need to darken it. Same in, uh, roughness inversion, just to be safe. Alpha mask goes in. Normal map, no detail mapping on this. Um, I have a transmission map, um, and that's going to get multiplied against the uh, uh, constant float, and that's plugged into the uh, subsurface color, and I just use it utilizing a simple grass and wind shader. Um, it's really easy to do, uh, so super, super useful. Let me just kind of close out of this. Don't save that. And let's, let me just change this window size, and I'll show you, um, you know, just kind of how this thing controls. Let's zoom over here so we can see the backside of this. And if you're wondering why it's getting darker and whatnot, I have clouds that are passing over the top to kind of simulate, you know, hey, that you're outside. Um, and those are not set up efficiently, so I'll talk about that in a second. They're not set up in a good way. Um, anyway, the uh, subsurface scattering, I'm just going to adjust this so you can see it. So you see it getting darker, right? And that's pretty much what this would be if you weren't really utilizing the uh, subsurface shader. So this gives you some really nice light bleak with the shadowing coming through it. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Um, looks really nice. Um, what else before we go and talk about the um, scan assets and whatnot? Uh, scattering was handled utilizing um, a combination of the drag and drop method. So 
Again, really basic stuff. Literally, static mesh filter, and then, you know, I literally just start going, I like that there. <laughs> and that was the extent of it. Um, let me just grab you, delete you. And, of course, utilizing the foliage tools, because they are awesome. Um, you know, you can kind of go in and really quickly just place a bunch of stuff really fast. The lighting setup is really straightforward. Um, uh, it's single directional, single skylight, um, with atmospheric uh, fog, and I think there's a little bit of fog in here as well. Um, and I'm utilizing a distance field along with uh, directional light contact shadows. Um, so really, really useful, really simple and easy to do. So I also really quickly wanted to just give a shout out to Eon about this. Um, Eon helped me out with a, um, with a bunch of questions, and he was just a really great resource. The guy is hella talented, too. He does some really awesome landscapes. So check out his stuff. And again, thanks, Eon, for the help. Uh, I really do appreciate it. And uh, so, again, you can see that the layout for this stuff, really generic, really straightforward and simple. Um, just close this down. Sorry, my computer is running so slow. I'm trying to capture this video in HD, and I don't really want to shut down programs because, I don't know, I'm doing other work. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the uh, vertex painting really quick while we're in here. Um, and just so you guys can kind of see this. Again, this isn't anything crazy. Like, nothing that I'm doing with this is, like, insane or you know, unique to this. This is just really getting in there and just utilizing the assets and uh, we'll let the clouds pass over us really quick so you guys can see this. Um, but basically I'm just darkening uh, the uh, the roughness in the uh, albedo contribution so it gives me a really nice wet look and I'll uh, change this guy up so it's white so you can see this. Right, so you can see here where it's darker and uh, the roughness is adjusted to give it that wet look. And you can see here on these rocks, it's really prevalent as well. You get the nice sheen off of it. And it's subtle. Like, honestly, it's maybe, I don't think it's overkill, but um, it's subtle, right? And that's not bad. That's kind of the stuff that you're after in a lot of cases. Uh, what else? Let's talk a little bit, too, about performance. And this has already been done once, so let me see if I can find an asset that doesn't have the LODs made. Not that guy. Uh, leaves this guy. Yeah, he doesn't have the LODs made. Okay, um, so for you guys who are um, interested in this stuff, uh, performance is monumentally important in general. Um, when you download the assets off of uh, the Megascan site, um, and when you log into it, it'll look like this. Um, you have, I'll just pull this up really quick. You have, um, when you do real-time rendering, you have a bunch of options here. Obviously, you have your sizes and all of those kind of things. But you have a bunch of these switches here. Um, and this is one of the things that I think makes Megascan so useful is, again, because they're a bunch of artists, they understand how important having all of this stuff is. Um, and they give you, like, literally all of the source content, the scan data, the Z tools, the brushes that they use, because, you know, you go in and they'll generate brushes for you to help sculpt stuff and add extra information. Um, and they give all of that to you, um, which is super useful. And the LEDs, if you guys have ever done LEDs, they're not hard. They're just a pain in the butt, because you got to export things. you got to make, like, three different versions of the mesh, and you got to realign them, and it can be kind of painful. However, in... Unreal 4.14, um, they introduced, uh, and they, they even had this before, they were using SimpleGon, but now this is just embedded in the engine, which is effing awesome. Uh, let's come down here to the LED settings here. And we're going to say this is a small prop. Absolutely. And it's going to rebuild the distance fields because this is the first time I've done it on this prop. Um, but I don't, uh, I'll let this kind of process through so. My computer isn't screaming. It's what happens when you have like two huge graphics cards in the box. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so I want you to pay attention to up here, this guy at the top left of the screen. If I zoom out, you can see it doing the auto decimation. And this is happening based off of screen space, which is super, super rad. Um, and you don't really have to do anything. It's just something you do when you're adjusting your light map settings. Um, so you can go ahead and minimize that. And I mean, you can't even tell. Um, 
So that's really useful, super helpful. The other thing to talk about, and I know that um, people have questions about this, especially if they're doing stuff in VR, if they're doing stuff um, for mobile devices, uh, some really nice performance considerations to check in, especially if you're dealing with a bunch of assets. Um, you probably really want to check out uh, the HLOD system, especially if you're going to be dealing with multiple draw calls, especially if you have a lot of assets um, that are just kind of out there. Uh, for example, uh, we have this guy and these two guys right here, right? And they're the same assets, right? Um, now, the way Unreal works is it goes, oh, cool, they're sharing the same material, they're sharing the same textures, cool, those, we're going to save on those. It's, it's one basic fetch, well, not one fetch, but it's basically one savings for those. Um, however, the mesh data, that's placed twice in the world, so sorry, it's two additional draw calls for the mesh. It's just, it is what it is. Um, so you can batch it in the distance, and the batching system is really nice because it'll auto-generate, auto-cluster, and auto-decimate. Um, and auto atlas if you tell it to the textures, which is really, really useful. Um, so it really works out well in the, that regard. So in general, I, I've got to say, the um, overall experience working with the scan data was fantastic. Uh, you know, I never really have any issues ever working with the Quixel guys. They're always so nice. Um, but, you know, in all honesty, though, I, you know, especially, you know, listening to a lot of artists and stuff and addressing concerns and stuff. Scan data is here. It's useful. It, it's something that is going to be part of our jobs. Even stylized stuff can utilize good scan data. Um, it's really about, for me, it's about time saving and where I can, you know, spend my time and where the things I don't really want to spend my time on, like doing billions of pebbles and those kind of things. Um, it's not that they're fun. It's just that during the run of a day, you know, if you're building out a bunch of environments, and depending on where you are in your career, you're maybe managing people, you, you do have to figure out ways to maximize your time. And I feel the scan data is just a great way to do that. You get super high fidelity mesh assets. Um, the There's consistency in the assets, so you know if you need to change or alter something, you can set up a consistent pipeline for it. Um, so it's really, really useful. Um, and I, I recommend, you know, playing around with it and kind of embracing it. Because I remember back when, um, kind of move around so it's a little bit more visually interesting. Um, I remember back in the day when I was doing stuff, you know, when ZBrush first came out. And no one wanted to touch ZBrush. They were like, oh, this is cheating. This is terrible. You can't do that. Now everyone uses it. Like, <laughs> so, you know, it's oftentimes it's just adjusting to new things. And that is a vital part of your job as an artist in this field is adapting, growing, seeing what kind of what the latest technology is and you know seeing how you can leverage it um, for your own platforms. So you guys if you have any questions you know shoot me a message on Facebook um, and you know just again huge shout out to everyone who helped on this it was a lot of fun um, in terms of just general asset or general layout time and stuff I think I've probably spent only like six to eight hours. Honestly, the longest par parts of this stuff, or tedious parts, I guess, would be importing the assets and making the videos. Uh, you've ever talked to me in person, I swear like a sailor. So uh, it takes a few videos for me to get that out. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much. And I encourage you guys to be checking out uh, the Megascans uh, content. It's, it's extremely useful. Um, it's really, really, I mean, an extremely high fidelity. If you even look at the assets inside of ZBrush, this is one of uh, the scan data pieces. You know, I mean, it's it's an awesome base to start sculpting off of and to build a really nice kit bash library off of. Fidelity is fantastic. We have a ton and ton of really um, great scan data, and it's super, super useful to be able to look at this thing from any angle and go, um, let's just pull from this side here, and we're just going to come over here and grab dot that. Okay, we have a really nice now alpha stamp that we can use to pull on other assets, and obviously you guys can sculpt the hell out of this. Okay, um, the thing that I would just, you know, I tell everyone about this, this is like your plant libraries, this is like anything else, they are tools to help you get into the mode of creating content faster. I definitely recommend that every artist who's using this stuff at least knows how to make the content, um, maybe not to the level of fidelity of a scan, it is a laser that's scanning a physical asset, um, 
but it's important to know how to make it, but it's also important to know how to make it so you can know where to save time and where your cost is going. And your cost, when I talk about cost in terms of asset development, you know, cost is deals with performance, it deals with the amount of time it takes you to build it, it deals with the amount of time and the money that you build, build your clients or to your studios that you work for. So, you know, figuring all that stuff out will help you be a more efficient artist in general, which is really good. Um, and again, this is mesh data. This is stuff is flexible with so many different pipelines, it's ridiculous. Um, the other awesome things to kind of check out to think about are all of the surface scans that are available on Megascan, uh, the Megascan website. That in conjunction with the Megascan Studio, you know, I mean, it's, you can, the possibilities are really frankly endless. You can really do a lot um, with them, especially since you have the mesh data, you can get the actual positional information so you can actually start really procedurally texturing things in a really efficient way. A little bit more of the scene off. Uh, the fog, uh, just there, I have the atmosphere, an exponential fog on, and then I also have some basic particles that are controlling the uh, fog settings, which are kind of useful. And as like I said, as of right now, uh, we're in the scene for this recording. I don't have the displacement turned on, but the displacement um, works rather well, um, and the displacement maps hold up hold up really really well um, as well. So this is kind of the just a basic. Um, overview of how I approached um, kind of using the mega scans. Uh, you know, for me in the future, especially for organic spaces, I I'll be using these things all the damn time. I um, you know, when it comes to production and comes to just general time usage, right? You have to kind of evaluate what you're spending your time on. Um, and for me, having such good high quality assets, even if I don't end up using all of the textures or even if it gets me to 50% of the way there, um, it's going to be super, super useful and it really does help out on the long term. So, you know, I recommend checking these things out. Um, I think scan data is just going to be part of the workflow. I mean, you can, since you have access to the height information, to the normal information, to all the textures, you can take this stuff and you can make all of this photo real, quote unquote. Um, assets, you can totally turn them stylized and you can do it really, really quickly. It doesn't require a ton of, uh, a ton of rework. And, you know, for, for artists and stuff, especially environment guys and girls, like, we have so many assets to juggle and to manage and so many things to kind of balance against that a lot of it is trying to figure out what the heck to do with your time and trying to figure out where to spend your time because, you know, you can't spend eight hours a day on every single asset and you sure as hell can't spend 12 hours a day on every asset you know so if you can get you know the debris and the scattering stuff kind of out of the way and done quick uh, quicker in a faster way I think it's really useful and whenever you know I always hear this question always come up like do, you know is scan data cheating do you think you're cheating um, you know the first thing I say is like especially for doing video game stuff like <laughs> real-time rendering it's all a cheat um, it's all running on a computer. We're all faking stuff to try and get it to work. Um, but it does definitely, in my opinion, come down to, you know, how, where do you want to spend your time? I, I would encourage every single artist to know how to sculpt a tree um, or to make a rock to any of these levels of quality. It's very doable to do it by hand. It just takes a bunch of time, right? So it's useful for everyone to know how to do it, but do you need to do it for every single thing? Absolutely not. Um, and I think, you know, especially the longer, you know, the longer I've been in productions, the longer I've been doing this stuff, the more and more I've worked with a multitude of very talented artists, you know, a lot of it is just trying to figure out, you know, they spend their time in really accurate areas or really specific areas. And for me, you know, it's trying to play with the lighting, trying to play with the composition, you know, trying to get stuff that looks, you know, really good and uh, reasonable amount of time. So again, the Quixel tools were fantastic to use. I highly, highly recommend them. Um, and before we go, I'm going to show you guys some of my processes for just scattering stuff out really quickly and placing stuff in the world. Nothing too fancy, but it'll at least give you guys hopefully a nice little hint on where to go. So thank you guys so much for checking this out. Um, this is a quick little uh, demo that they asked me to kind of put together uh, for them, and it was it was a lot of fun, you know, I, I really enjoyed working 
um, with it. It was quick, it was easy, obviously, because I didn't have to model, model all the stuff out. Um, but uh, the, the flexibility with this stuff um, in future projects is definitely something that um, I'll be heavily, heavily uh, utilizing. Um, and it just, it just helps in the general creative process. You know, you really get to do a lot with this and it really does help. So uh, thanks so much for watching and uh, we'll talk to you guys. Peace.